Is SMS still insecure? What are some underrated automations? How do we use VPN split tunneling? Welcome to Surveillance Report 183 Q&A, where we answer questions from our amazing patrons who allow us to make this podcast for all of you. You can join the questions on patreon.com slash surveillance pod, and there's a link in the description if you can't remember that or whatever. And just for those who maybe didn't see the, the original episode on Sunday, Henry is traveling currently and his recording setup isn't super reliable, so there might be video, there might not be, but if you see a little still frame or if the video looks kind of weird, that's why is we prioritize getting the best audio we could instead of video. Our first question this week comes from Gunner, who says, everyone says the SMS is not secure and that the message is sent without any encryption, but that seems to be not quite correct. Here where I live, the operator supports RCS and RCS supports end-to-end -end encryption, at least according to the documentation. I checked and many of my contacts also have activated RCS, but not all of them have activated end-to-end -end encryption. Why, I don't know. So my question is, have you seen this before? Can we believe what the documentation says that it is really end-to-end -end encrypted? All right, so I have not dug as deeply into RCS as I would like to, but I have done a little bit of digging. RCS can support end-to-end -end encryption, but not all of it does by default. So your experience is correct. Can we trust the documentation? I think so. Usually companies don't lie about that kind of stuff unless they're Zoom. However, what I would be more concerned about is the metadata. As far as I know, RCS does not offer any protection against metadata. The last thing I want to offer is, you're right, you say SMS is not secure and is sent without any encryption, but that's not quite correct. That is true. By default, regular SMS technically, from what I understand, does have encryption, but it is so weak especially on like 2G and 3G networks, 2G especially, it is so weak that it's basically non-existent. It may as well be plain text. That said, the, the last thing I wanted to add here is RCS is new. So all of the advice you see online about SMS is not secure and it's not encrypted, that's not wrong. It's just that all that information was written before RCS was a thing. And now that RCS is starting to roll out, that might change the game. Again, though, might, because RCS does not automatically imply end-to-end -end encryption. It could come with encryption, which again, there's still metadata concerns, but it would be a step forward. Yeah, I don't really have much to add. Just to expand on the SMS thing, I think that there's like basic encryption over the air, but that's about it. I guess I'm just going to add a fun detail. Mm. You're using RCS with Google Messages and it's end-to-end -end encrypted. They're actually utilizing the signal protocol to do that end-to-end -end encryption. Just a fun fun detail. Again, that doesn't include the signal metadata protection. You should still use signal if you're trying to prioritize privacy and security uh, instead of just something that uses the signal protocol. But yeah, I don't have much more to add here. David Johnson asked, what are some of the most helpful automations in the sphere of digital privacy or security that you have either implemented for yourself or have seen and wish to implement? They mentioned examples like data removal services and package managers are a couple of well-known examples. What are others you rely on or are impressed by? I probably rely on a lot. And I don't even think about it because to me, when I find a more convenient and efficient way to do something that doesn't compromise on privacy and security very much, I normally do it. And so if I really sat down and made a list, I could probably list off a lot of things. But yes, I used to use a data removal service. I use a bind delete me. So that's already an easy example. Like my NAS, I think is just overall a huge automation tool because it allows me to always do backups of all my devices all the time, which serves as my backup automation tool. I'd say also for me, I was somebody who didn't use to sync things very much between devices. And I'd say that for me, kind of embracing some syncing is in itself an automation that might be of a default behavior for a lot of people, but finding ways to like centralize and sync a few things in my life has actually been very helpful and it's led to less issues in my workflow. So I can get more work done, keep things more consolidated where they need to be and not lose data and not lose projects or get behind on too many things. So I think that's, that's most of what I have. I could probably find a lot of examples, but if I find a more efficient way to do something, I almost always uh, go ahead and try to jump on it. Yeah, I think the, the one that really throws me for a loop there is package managers, because when you count that and like expand the definition in that sense, it definitely opens up a lot of doors. The single most helpful one, I'm going to cheat here, is a, a custom one that was built for me by my web developers and Jonah from Privacy Guides for the new oil. I use GitHub because they have a desktop app. I use GitHub to update the website. And once I push to GitHub, it pushes to the server. It's also the mirror for the onion service and it mirrors to GitHub or GitLab. So I click one button on my desktop 
which works reliably, and GitHub, the ClearNet site, the Onion service, GitLab, and Crowdin, I forgot about that one, all get updated simultaneously. And God, it is heaven, and I love it so much. It has completely changed my workflow back here. But obviously, that's specific to the new oil. Most people wouldn't have any need for something like that. I think, yeah, just like cloud services and syncing are pretty awesome. Automatic updates. I, I mean, that's an automation. I don't know. I mean, installation, like installing things like degoogled phones has become pretty easy if you just follow the instructions. Like, I guess it depends on what you define as an automation. But yeah, I mean, there's a lot of really good ones out there. Again, I'm not going to like turn this over to the community, but definitely leave in the comments if you guys have any really good ones that you found. Because yeah, I feel like this is probably a space where there might be like you said, there might be some that are less widely known, and there's probably a ton out there that none of us have even considered that are probably amazing. And it was a short week this week, so our last question comes from Patreoner Upliftingly. It was kind of all one word, so I'm not sure if I pronounced that right. Can you explain your security workflow as it pertains to split tunneling with a VPN? I would like to take advantage of this where possible, but a lack of a framework to use to determine which apps and under what conditions. I use Rethink with Proton VPN via WireGuard, and I am attempting to gain some level of app control without fully rooting my pixel. So generally speaking, at least on my desktop, and I think I might do this on my phone, but I'm not sure, I will split tunnel things that I am positive are secure. Things where I know I'm going to take a hit, like Tor, for example. And I know Jonah has a whole video about how there is a reason to use a VPN with Tor, which I respect. I'm content just using Tor and letting it be faster. So I split tunnel Tor outside my VPN. I split tunnel Signal just so that when I'm on these calls with Henry, I have better video quality and things work smoother. Stuff like that. On my phone, there are a couple apps that I'm not necessarily thrilled about using, but um, well, I'll say it, the grocery store app. My wife uses that. We both use it because it's very convenient to have a shared list where we can dump and it's exactly what we want. You know, it's got pictures, it's got aisle numbers, it's every, it's really helpful. But they're also really aggressive about not using a VPN, which pisses me off. But in my case, because of the convenience that we share in being able to have that shared account, it's kind of worth it to me. So I split tunnel that outside the VPN just to get the grocery store to shut up and work right. I think I split tunnel my pseudo just because I mostly use it for work and I kind of want to make sure I get calls reliably. It really comes back to your threat model. It comes back to why do you want to split tunnel it? Even things that are secure, like on my phone, I still leave signal behind a VPN because it works fine and I see no reason not to. I guess I would just ask what benefit using a VPN would provide for each service on your phone or your computer. I do think the easiest thing to do is to just route everything system-wide to not even have to go into that. And that way you can just, in general, be able to define why you use a VPN on a device and then not have to pick and choose uh, and just make your life a little bit easier. I'm seeing a lot of people ask a lot more about kind of what I'm calling the private relay workflow. For the people who don't know, essentially, Private Relay's Apple's VPN. It's actually not bad. Um, it has some really interesting features that I would like to see some of those features implemented into like VPN providers that we know and talk about. The issue with Apple's Private Relay is it only works in the browser. So it's pretty much a browser-only VPN. And I think it's actually interesting because I think the assumption in my head is if you're downloading an app to your phone, it's probably something you trust. And... A lot of them are, you're logged into your personal account, etc. But then when you use the internet, you, you know, you're just visiting random websites, then you might actually, that's probably where you get most of the benefit for using a VPN for a lot of people. So I'm not saying that's the, the right workflow for everybody. It's just something I've been thinking about more recently about kind of the middle grounds between not using a VPN and using one system wide. My answer to your question is ask each provider, like why would a VPN benefit this? How will it hold it back? And then pick and choose. And I think obviously some providers just won't even let you use a VPN and they'll make that choice really easy for you. Like I said, short week. That was all the questions we had this week. So is SMS still insecure? What are some of the underrated automations? Definitely leave yours in the comments and you know, let's grow stronger as a community. And how do we approach split tunneling? Thank you guys for tuning in and asking questions. Again, we really appreciate all of our patrons who support this podcast. We appreciate your questions. If you are not already on Patreon and you would like to ask us a question, you can join in over at Patreon, patreon.com slash surveillance pod. Thank you guys for asking questions. Thank you guys for watching. And we'll see you this week with our next episode of Surveillance Report.